we're live. Welcome everybody to this webinar. Uh, we have called it the geopolitics of COVID-19 and climate change. And um, uh, we are so glad uh, we have so many uh, attendees to this webinar. Uh, and my name is Eva Krutmeier. Uh, I'm a Swedish science communicator and moderator. And now in front of your eyes, I'm sort of transformed into a digital version of myself. Uh, facilitating webinars and online meetings instead of real ones. The coronavirus changes everything for all of us. Uh, I've been working with the Mistra Geopolitics Research Program for some years now, and uh, we've actually never had so many participants at any event before. So you're over 1000 women and men out there all over the world who have actually registered for this seminar, webinar it is, sorry. I want each of you to feel warmly welcome and uh, we all hope to be able to meet your expectations. So you can take the next slide there, Ian. <clears throat> the expectations today are around knowledge. The situation is serious and full of uncertainties. Today, the 3rd of April 2020, um, we are probably just in the beginning of this pandemic. People are dying in the world. In our research program, Mr. Geopolitics, we use the tagline navigating towards a secure and sustainable future. What do we make of this under today's circumstances? Could this pandemic be the catalyst for societal transformation towards sustainability? Or Will efforts to restore business as usual drive a new surge of carbon emissions, fear and international distrust? We see signs of generosity and protectionism going on at the same time. How can we understand this? And how does the pandemic affect the climate negotiation processes and the 2030 agenda, but also initiatives like the new European Green Deal and the Chinese Belt and Road initiatives. These are all examples of issues that we will discuss today. So, some house rules on the next picture. I think it is. Yeah, there we are. So, you as an attendee to this webinar uh, are more than welcome to use this Q&A button. You see it there on the screen. It's a question mark in a little bubble. Uh, please note your name and country or organization because it's nice for us to know who you are. Uh, be short and clear is of course good always and we will try to answer also short and clear. I will encourage the panelists to do so. And I also want to inform you that this webinar is being recorded and you can see it afterwards from our website. Please uh, use the hashtag uh, Mr. Geopolitics and COVID-19 if you want to do some tweets or whatever during this seminar. Okay, Ian, let's look at the next slide, please. Here we have the agenda for the webinar and uh, I would like now every um, presentation, you see present, presenter, you can see we have seven of them, so it's quite a tight program here. I would like to um, turn to each one of you. And I begin with uh, Björn Ola Linnéer, our program director, Mr. Politics. Can you wave and say hello for us? Hello. On the mic, that's better. Hello. That's better that you use the microphone. That's true. Unmute and say hello. Great. Hi. And uh, then I turn to Dan Smith, the director of CIPRI. Can we also have a hello, hello from you? Yeah, hi. Glad to be here. I think it lags a little, so there you are. Now we can all see you. Wave, Dan, please. Yeah, I already waved Thank twice. You. But, happy to do it. <laughs> but you were not in. You were not live then. Oh. So then we have uh, Matthias Frumery. Are you with us, Matthias, on the phone? Yes. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm so glad because we had some technical uh, challenges. <laughs> Just before, but now we can yeah, hear you. I'm afraid I can't join you in. Yes. Good. Matthias from, Marie from the Swedish uh, uh, Foreign Ministry. We are so glad that you're with us. 
Nick Mibay, Director E3G, are you with us? Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. Can we all can we see you there also? Yeah, yeah. Let's see if you're in picture. I'm Good. Perfect. Wonderful, wonderful. And you are actually sitting in your house in uh, outside London or where where are you, Nick? In the heart of COVID riven London. Oh. Yeah, this is the, the situation we are all in now. So Eva Lövbrand from Linköping University. Hello. You're in your home in Stockholm. Yes. Hello. Hello. Hello, waving there. Thank you very much. And Victor Galas, Stockholm Resilience Center, Deputy Director. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Can we see you there also? In the picture? Lovely. Last but not least, Osa Persson, Research Director at SEI. Hello. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Hello there. Hi. Lovely to see you. Uh, then I would like to turn to Robert Watt, uh, Communications Director at SEI. Are you with us, Rob? I am. You are, and you will help me with the Q&A session. Uh, I'm so glad and grateful for that. And you're actually on the little island of Öland, aren't you? That's right, Eva. Great to That's be with right. you. Thank you. Thank you for participating. So that was about it. And then we have Ian, our producer. Please wave, Ian. You are the hero. If this works, it's all thanks to you. <laughs> so please, um, let's continue uh, and start the presentations. Uh, what we will do now is that we will have five minutes for each presenter. And I will try to be as harsh as I can with my scissors cutting you after five minutes uh, so that we can listen to all presenters first and then we will moderate a Q&A session. So what you do then once again is that you text your question in the Q&A session there. You, we can't have you uh, unfortunately in picture all of you but we can see your questions when you post them and we will try of course to ask as many as we can, answer as many as we can. So but now are you all with us? So let's start with the first presentation then. And uh, Björn Ola Linier, uh, you are a professor in environmental change at the Center for Climate Science and Policy Research at Linköping University in Sweden. And uh, you are also actually an associate research fellow at the Institute for Science, Innovation and Society at Oxford University. Uh, you are, of course, also the program director of the Mistra Geopolitics program. So I leave the word now to you, Bjarnola. Thank you. As an introduction to today's uh, webinar, I will shortly present the focus of this research program, Mistra Geopolitics, and why we focus on the concepts of societal transformation and disruptions. So could I have the uh, next, first slide, please? Oh, or the other slide, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there we go. Yes, the Minister Geopolitics focus on the dynamics of geopolitics and sustainable development in the intersection between national security, human security, environmental change and global governance. Next slide, please. We do this in uh, three areas. So the geopolitics of decarbonization. Next slide, please. Uh, the geopolitics of decarbonization, food security and sustainable oceans. So the COVID-19 virus seems poised to bring about economic and geopolitical disruptions and ultimately societal transformations that may well define our coming decades. In Mr. Geopolitics, we focus on three transformative processes. Next slide, please. First, we have the great acceleration of environmental and socioeconomic changes, as illustrated by the graphs of with Stefan and colleagues on the left hand upper corner. Uh, second, to address these uh, global environmental challenge, uh, changes, societal transformation towards uh, sustainability is a growing political ambition around the world. Transforming our world is the headline of the 2030 Agenda for, uh, of the Sustainable Development Goals. Fundamental transformation of our societies are also necessary for achieving greener, cleaner, healthier and more resilient societies by, for example, the European Commission's Green, European Green Deal that was launched in, in the autumn and many other countries, cities and companies around the world. Still, 
how we how sustainable transformations are made sense of that it varies significantly across societies something that we might return to in these discussions i saw that from some of the early questions third we see an ongoing uh, technological driven transformation driven by artificial intelligence machine learning nanotechnologies gene editing and and so on all these uh, processes changes the geopolitical landscape so President uh, Donald Trump and the Swedish activist Greta Thunberg represents two radically different answers to these changes that profoundly alters international and transnational politics, but also the geopolitical landscape of climate policy. Next slide, please. What is then implied by the concept of transformation? The butterfly's metamorphosis from pupa through caterpillar to butterfly is a frequently used allegory for transformations. The concept of transition is often used to signal change from one state to another, such as from an energy system based on carbon to one based on renewables. This does not necessarily involve profound changes of society. Societal transformations, in contrast, signals profound, enduring, non-linear systemic change of how we organize our societies and live our lives. It involves social, cultural, technological, political and ecological processes. Defined this way, the COVID-19 re reduction in pollution is far from an inspiring transformative event. Societies are just put on pause. The transformative potential of deep enduring systems change lies rather in the perspective shifts that the crisis can trigger among us individuals and the enormous leverage that the enor enormous economic recovery programs can provide. The ultimate goal of Mr. Geopolitics is to enhance the foresight capacity in a changing geopolitical landscape. So in a major participatory scenario exercise with our stakeholders, we explore multiple scenarios of how the world might evolve, evolve over the next uh, decades. We identified many dislocations with our stakeholders. Pandemics was identified as a wild card, but not presented as a major disruptor in our summary scenarios. It's against this background we want to better understand the role of disruptive events for society transformations. Next slide, please. One so what are societal disruptions? It can be defined as occurrences that interrupt the system or process from continuing as usual or as ex ex expected. Its Latin root means break apart. A disruptor can be a technology, a political event, an environmental disaster or a virus. Next slide, please. Some see disruptive events as essential to enable societal transformations. Disruptions to trigger transformations typically involve all three spheres of uh, transformations, the practical, the political and personal. Others argue that disruptions could be actually working towards against the transformation. The revolutionary uh, approach could be make things go too fast. We lack the legitimacy of the trans sustainability transformations and so on. But in times of crisis, social structures and institutions are put to test. Normal practices and habits are called into question. Disruptions uproot and alter how we make sense of the world, how we behave, do business, do politics, learn and go about our daily lives. Historically, we can also see how disruptions can become defining moments. It can lead to frustration, polarization and social unrest. But it can also prompt new perspectives, practices, cultural expressions, alter power relations and novel opportunities for production and consumption. Last slide, please. Historian William Sewell has pointed how disruptions produce profound uncertainty, how we get on with life. He argues that, I quote, this uncertainty is a necessary condition for the kind of collective creativity that characterizes so many historical events. End of quote. The geopolitics in the aftermath of COVID-19 may well be a defining historic moment for climate policy. It could be the, it could tip, be tipping the scales of the Paris Agreement. We may see a turn towards uh, greater isolationism and a carbon intensive recovery. That's quite likely. But we could also see an international politics of generosity, a golden opportunity to turn recovery programs to green deals that can instigate and navigate transformations towards greener, healthier and more just and resilient societies. So I look very much look forward to today's discussion on uh, what path COVID-19 will set us on. Thank you.
Thank you so much, uh, Björn Ola Linnéer. And uh, I'm so sorry we can't hear the applause, but <laughs> they are out there. <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, here we see also all the partners of uh, the Geopolitics, Mr. Geopolitics program on the slide. I will now actually turn directly to our next speaker. And um, we welcome uh, Dan Smith the director of CIPRI, the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute. Uh, he has a long record of research and publications on a wide range of issues, such as conflict and peace and relationship between climate change and insecurity, gender aspects of conflict and peace building, and global conflict trends. So we are very, very curious to hear your five minutes, Dan Smith. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I can see the live um, symbol beside my picture on the little screen. So I hope you can hear me. It's a real pleasure to be joining you all today. What I really want to do is to, I suppose, is to question some of what seems to me a general thinking that actually Bianola was just uh, expressing now, which is the, the hopeful possibility that we learn from the crisis response to COVID in a way that allows us to deal much more positively with, uh, with climate change. And I'm not going to do that by outlining the alternative nightmare uh, scenarios. Um, but let me, but I want to look into the issues of knowledge and mindset in the world as it seems to us now to be changing. And I think it's probably a quite shared assessment or a shared impression that there can be game changers uh, in the current COVID situation, game changers for international transport, game changers for the relationship between state and economy, uh, game changers for how we think about uh, our leaders, game changers perhaps for some political ideologies, both for perhaps good and bad. And where I want to start is with what is thought to be one of the great slogans of um, the British stiff upper lip from the Second World War. So if you can move to the uh, first of my slides, apart from this one, Ian. There you are, keep calm and carry on. Uh, it's one of the most uh, famous slogans to come out of the Second World War. The interesting thing was that the, this poster was not actually disseminated by the British during the Second World War. And even more interestingly, what it was planned for was for use if there were a German landing, if there were a German invasion of Britain, then the British people were going to be told to keep calm and carry on. Carry on with what? I'm not quite sure, but it seemed to me, thus when I was thinking about this, to be the kind of advice you give when it's a bit too late. And I think that too many leaders have shown the wrong kind of calm. Um, it hasn't been an impressive display of resilience, has it, in our international political systems to see so many uh, political leaders going into denial and then into certain kinds of disinformation. And I'm not only thinking about Donald Trump when I say that. Um, so what we have displayed to ourselves um, is somewhat unresilient domestic and international societies. And far from keep calm and carry on, if you will show the next slide, which is the result of some witty people messing around with well-known slogans. And what we've had has been closer to now panic and freak out. And I think in some ways I would see these two slogans as trying to generalize approaches as potentially being the opposite sides of the same coin. So if you put up, if you now hit the animation switch, there you go. Um, what we're looking for, I think, is something which is neither the fake calm of keep calm and carry on old chat, nor the throwing everything up in the air of now panic and freak out. So what in these circumstances should we be looking for in essence of resilience? Since I started looking at the relationship between climate change and insecurity, one of the things that has struck me most strongly is that in many ways resilience is fungible quality. That if you are as a community resilient to the impact of say a conflict in a neighboring area, then you are probably relatively speaking resilient to the impact of climate change or of a flood or of a change in the economic conditions or of an influx of refugees. And why is this? What are the qualities which explain why resilience 
is fungible. I think there are two. I think that one is the ability to handle information, to receive information even if it's unwelcome, to look it straight in the eye, to discuss it, to process it, to disseminate it, to draw conclusions and to act upon it. And the second thing I think that resilient societies of all kinds show is the capacity for cooperation. Now, if with one eye, what we have seen is a non-resilient approach as far as information is concerned during the COVID crisis, with the other eye, part of what we've seen is the weakness around cooperation. We've seen a slamming of, of doors. We've seen um, the rise of blame the other uh, kind of political sentiments. I see you. Oh, we've seen the rise of a kind of nationalism. We've seen governments trying to resolve these, these situations by themselves. And this, I think, is where the geopolitics comes in. Because in today's toxic geopolitics, we see on the one hand with climate change, with cyber, crisis, uh, cyber vulnerabilities, and now with COVID, uh, a rising need for international cooperation, at the same time as we seem, unfortunately, to see a declining appetite for it and a declining respect for the norms that support and the laws that enable uh, cooperation. And then I think it has to be said that that is looking at things at a governmental and political level. And what we also see in social movements and indeed in parts of the private sector are far more encouraging signs of both being able to handle information, of wanting clarity and of being able to cooperate. So I think that somewhere from some source we need to derive a socially based challenge to the geopolitics that seem to be emerging at the moment and then we will have a geopolitics or a political relations that are fit for purpose in a climate changing Anthropocene world. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dan. Uh, extremely interesting there. And uh, I'm sure we will come back to many of the issues you discussed in the Q&A session. Thank you so much. Now I turn to Matthias and uh, Matthias Rumeri, you're with us on the phone. I hope we can hear you. Yes. Yes, we can. Uh, you are um, actually uh, talking to us from the Global Agenda Department at the Swedish Ministry, Ministry for Foreign Affairs. And uh, as a climate diplomat, uh, it's very interesting for us uh, to, to uh, listen to your, to your um, uh, perspectives here. We've just heard that uh, COP26 in Glasgow has been postponed. Uh, please tell us more about the corona crisis and the effect on the ongoing negotiations, please. Uh, thanks very much and, and uh, it's such a privilege to be on this very distinguished panel. So I'll, I'll just try to make basically three um, brief points and then we'll be looking forward to, to joining the discussion. Um, mm. I, mean, I, I guess uh, anyone who essentially doubted the, the the impact of COVID-19 on climate action. Uh, I mean, as you mentioned, we, we just need to look at the decision to postpone COP26 um, taken earlier this week. Um, I mean, we're, we're obviously working now together with EU partners and, uh, and our UK partners to set a date uh, for COP26 during uh, 2021. Uh, hopefully that will be set within a month or so. Um, but, but I would assume that many would be also answering questions, sort of putting questions as to what happens now with the kind of ambition that we wanted to see during 2020. I mean, as we all know, 2020 was supposed to be the year of ambition where par parties to the Paris Agreement were to hand in their new and revised nationally determined contributions or NDCs. Obviously, I, mean, I think it's fair to say that we, we will be seeing delays in that process just because of the uh, sort of the sheer massive crisis that many countries are facing right now. Um, so, sort of how will we be able to mobilize that kind of action for, for climate uh, in, at a time when, when economies are struggling and, and people are dying? Um, so, uh, I mean, of course, we will be doing everything we can from the from the Swedish side to make sure that we both, from from the Swedish and the EU perspective, uh, are doing our bit and also supporting other countries in as far as we can to sort of to to keep momentum going. 
and make sure that we're delivering on the kind of, of, of commitments which we've done um, in the Paris Agreement. So, so that will be my um, my first point on, on sort of keeping ambition alive uh, throughout 2020 and beyond. My second point would be sort of also what earlier presenters have have, have been alluding to, also sort of the, the both the 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 similarities and the differences sort of between the two crises we're working on. So sort I of mean the the massive uh, impact of, of the corona crisis, but also the climate crisis and how we sort of what kind of lessons can we learn from, from for climate action when it comes to um, uh, sort of making having lessons from from the uh, how we're dealing with the corona crisis. I mean the we've been speaking about the urgency of climate action for such a long time. Um, and um, so what can we learn from the massive mobilization we've seen in terms of resources and adjusting uh, so quickly to uh, this, uh, the, the situation that we're right now in, uh, you know, what kind of lessons can be drawn from that also when it comes to climate action, but also when it comes to charting our way out of this crisis. Um, and I, uh, as, as I think we'll hear more about also the sort of how we are setting uh, the, the recovery of the crisis in the context of implementing the SDGs and the Paris Agreement. How do we make sure that we are sort of delivering on those kind of commitments, which are already there in the Paris Agreement? And I think the the UN Secretary General put it very nicely also to uh, to uh, to leaders of the G20 um, just ahead of their summit last week on the of the importance of making sure that the recovery efforts from COVID-19 are sort of are, are building into our our implementation of the SDGs and and the Paris Agreement. And I would hope that we, as, you know, as, as Sweden and else also uh, throughout Europe as a whole, can build on the good examples that, we're, that we already have. I mean, the, the Green Deal presented by, uh, by the European Commission, the, the, um, the commitment by European Council uh, in December for climate neutrality by 2050. Uh, many of you would have read the Financial Times this morning saying that the Green Deal is now uh, sort of put on the back burner. I think all of us working with, with climate action would be um, doing our very best to make sure that that would not be the case, but rather finding ways to sort of to to link the the way out of the crisis to uh, the work ongoing on on uh, on climate action. And my final point would be uh, sort of picking up on one of your questions initially, sort of on on the. Uh, how how does this crisis that we're in, um, how could that serve as a catalyst for maybe new ways of working? And I think um, you know, just looking at the the, the climate um, negotiations and and how we're you know when when I started this job uh, 18 months ago or something, and it was really struck me sort of the enormity of the negotiation process. You know with 20 or maybe even 30,000 participants at, at each at each COP, um, you know, and asking questions to colleagues: Do we really need to be these you know, have these massive events uh, in order to move, move the climate agenda forward? And I guess never before has the well, uh, I mean, the, the 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 English saying, you know, be careful what you wish for, uh, has maybe not been been <laughs> sort of come true in that in in that sense uh, that we now. Could maybe we, we're forced, obviously, to to look into new ways of working. But maybe we can also see that as as the possibility to see, you know, how can we do things differently. Um, we had a, a call in one of the committees done in uh, the C system. We had a, a call yesterday to bring our work forward. Uh, was in the steering committee for the NDC partnership last week uh, to bring that work forward. So I think we're already seeing uh, how we're adjusting. So there are positive kind of signs there, there Matthias. I, I would think so, yes. Uh, so mm, I, mean, mm. I, I think maybe just to finish off on that, to see mm. how we can actually use those new wa mm. working methods also to bring the climate agenda forward in, in, in different ways. Wonderful. I'll stop there, thanks. Mm. Thank you very much, Matthias. And, uh, and we will come back to, to those questions. Uh, and uh, I will now directly turn to our next speaker, uh, and that is Nick Maybe from uh, the E3G um, uh, think tank. E3G stands for Third Generation Environmentalism and uh, you are a founder director of this think tank. It's a non-profit European organization 
dedicated to accelerating the transition to sustainable development. And uh, I would like also to uh, tell you that uh, Nick uh, is working very much on European climate and energy policies, climate diplomacy, foreign policy, and he's also actually been working for the UK Prime Minister's Strategy Unit, uh, leading work on energy and climate change. And also prior to that, uh, at the UK Foreign Office Environment and Policy Department, uh, where you actually helped establishing the UK's I would say world leading environmental diplomacy network, uh, uh, Nick. So we are so honored and happy that you are one of the presenters here today. And uh, I've promised you a couple of more minutes than the others, just because you're a guest here. So please go ahead. Uh, the word is yours, Nick. OK, thanks very much. Um, next slide, please. So what I'm going to talk about is really complementary to the others, which is really how the climate community is starting to respond. And firstly, I'm going to really apologize for a number of words on the slides you're about to see. Um, but that's because they are working documents from our internal and network discussions about what we're actually going to do as opposed to well honed presentations. So um, take this as a glimpse of thinking in action um, from the front line of, of um, trying to respond. And um, these are discussions with both governments and non-governmental organizations. Um, I'm not gonna read all the slides, but gonna try and push some of the key messages and some of the ways our thinking is moving. Next slide. So I think really, I'm not to add much more. The, the main thing I would point out is that Everybody's talking as if the main issue is the response, the health response to COVID, but we're already seeing second round impacts on debt in particular and economic growth, particularly in emerging and developing countries and in oil exporting countries, which could lead to a financial crisis, um, which people are also responding to, and the potential for third round impacts. We're already seeing some countries restricting food exports. And if you remember the food price, oil price crisis, um, in the late 2000s before the financial crisis. Um, again, we could see social stability impacts. So again, it's a time of high uncertainty and um, this is not gonna be the only wave of action going forward. And as someone said, the balance of cooperation versus isolation is still very unclear with US and China doing some rather silly public diplomacy on Twitter and through op-eds with each other. Um, next slide. But what does it mean for climate action? Um, Pre-COVID, we had very flat and oppositional geopolitics, and we were looking for COP26 and the Convention on Biodiversity to really create geopolitical momentum around cooperation and, and action. Um, we're completely changed now because COVID has created a huge geopolitical and geoeconomic wave, which now climate change has to react to, harness and engage with. So we're moving from an agenda setting approach to fitting into a mainstream agenda. It means that COP26 is less important in terms of driving overall action because the stimulus packages will do that in many ways, but it's really vital to show the Paris regime of multilateralism is alive and working to drive cooperation. Um, the whole economic response to COVID is gonna set the context for next five years minimum in terms of this, and it will interact with climate impacts. So the climate will carry on changing to shape national and international social contracts. And of course, for the next 10 years, we'll be living with the debt burden, which has been racked up by COVID response packages. So the economics of action will be influenced hugely. And it's really unclear if there's going to be a big change to that or if we'll see a pivot back to austerity politics. And the third point is government action and therefore the politics of climate will become relatively more important because COVID is increasing the role and influence of the state in economic decision making. So next slide. So that means quite a fundamental change for climate politics and people trying to shift the political climate um, on climate change. Firstly, um, we need to move from a momentum based approach based around international events and high profile people and announcements to really an interest based approach. So why should people constructing post COVID recovery packages actually look at climate change issues? What's their interest? So it's a very different approach to winning the debate. Um, we need to look at this geopolitics of cooperation 
and understand there's no neutral economic stimulus for the climate. This stimulus packages over the next 18 months will either put us back or put us forward. And that means climate actors need to get into spaces perhaps they're less used to getting into in terms of mainstream political and economic policy. It's a real challenge to us as influencers to move forward. And there already is an attack on climate action as a luxury good and an inhibitor of growth and recovery and health spending, both from ideological opponents and you know, some in the development community and other sectors who have always seen climate as a thing long, far, far away and not something immediate. So we need to look at complementary agendas with other sectors rather than competition that requires us to reach out to a broader set of actors. And then there'll be debates over the relative role of state and markets. And we're already seeing people weaponizing plus injudicious tweets about the humans of the virus and let's look at the wonderful economic benefits of the crisis. Some of those tweets are invented by right wing provocateurs um, to say this is what Greenies always wanted, the destruction of the global economy. So what it means is um, climate action and activism needs to move to accelerate mainstreaming into core debates and being strong alliances with health, economic development, peace building and other sectors. So we needed to do this anyway, but we would think it was a five year process. Now it's going to be a year and a half process. So final slide. So we've wrapped that analysis into four kind of key challenges we think both governments and non-governmental actors who are pushing for climate action will need to face um, immediately and start organizing around. The first one, which many have mentioned, is the geopolitics of cooperation. How do we move beyond the initial narrative stage? We're seeing lots of op-eds and movements about cooperation to turn that into practical geopolitics and make 2021 a kind of super year for cooperation across all of the issues. And especially because of the UK and Italy running the G7 and G20, and hopefully with a democratic president, there's a real potential there to do that, but it needs practical projects to move around. It's not just writing good speeches. Secondly, as the UN Secretary General said, recovering better. How do we make sure the immediate stimulus packages don't invest in the wrong things? And there's a lot of um, oil and gas companies trying to get their hands on public money, but also looking at practical medium to long-term recovery. We had lots of good speeches in the last crisis about green stimulus, but only 15% of the money was spent on green. And part of that was because we didn't have the mechanisms to actually make things happen. So this is not just, again, needs to go beyond analysis to what's the practical ways of making this happen. Thirdly, we need to build a global resilience alliance, which is bringing together health, food security, development, economic, peace building communities inside and outside government to say, we have built a very fragile and non-resilient international and national systems. We need to change the way we make immediate decisions and investments, but also the longer term regulation and governance. And I think that's going to be the big battle of ideas next year. That's that's the one we have to win collectively if we're going to make sure we don't set ourselves up for more crises. And the last one is a is really going to roll out a bit beyond that kind of winning the culture war. What's this going to say about the balance between authoritarian and liberal states in terms of protecting their people? What's the cultural impact going to be on behavior? What's this going to impact on the social contract? I think that's going to roll out kind of deep, deep change over the next piece and who's and to make sure that um, that's a pro climate, pro sustainability um, narrative is going to be vitally important. So I'll stop there. But these are these are how we're trying to work with others to build and reprofile all our work, um, practical work as politics and influencers um, in light of COVID. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, let's see if I can. Thank you so much, uh, Nick, and thank you for sharing your, your work in progress here. Uh, really uh, wonderful. And uh, I turn directly to, to our next speaker, although I would like to ask a lot of questions there, but we'll keep keep uh, the pace here. So uh, Eva Lövbrand, um, it's our second speaker from Linköping University, actually, although I think you're based in Stockholm at the moment. Uh, Eva is a senior lecturer and in her research, she explores how ideas, knowledge claims and expert practices are enacted, legitimated and used in global environmental politics. Uh, and governance, of course. So today you have chosen the title, we cannot solve a crisis without treating it as a crisis. Tell us more about it, Eva. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. So uh, about a month ago, when the coronavirus started to get a grip of the European 
continent. I was doing research on the Fridays for Future movement, uh, reading through Greta Thunberg's uh, public speeches that now are nicely summarized in the Penguin book. No one is too small to make a difference. This one that you can also see on the slide, I think, here, if we have the right slide up. Yes, very good. So uh, throughout her public speeches, Greta effectively insists that we cannot solve the climate crisis without treating it as a crisis. So it's a direct quote from her, it's not my words. So to secure livable and safe climates for generations to come, we must pull the emergency brake, claims Greta, and stop our excessive burning of fossil fuels. So what you see on, on this slide is an excerpt from a speech that Greta held at an Extinction Rebellion meeting in London two months after she had initiated her school strike outside the Swedish parliament. And um, so here is her quote. They keep on saying that climate change is an existential threat and the most important issue of all. And yet they just carry on like before. There are no headlines, no emergency meetings, no breaking news. No one is acting as if we were in a crisis. Even most green politicians and climate scientists go on flying around the world, eating meat and dairy. When reading through Greta's speeches and, and doing research on the, uh, on the Fridays for Future movement, it's clear that Greta's message of climate urgency is informed by scientific calculations of the global carbon budget, which is the amount of carbon that we still can emit before global, global mean warming reaches. A given temperature target, and, and in this case, they refer to the Paris Agreement's temperature target of 1.5 or 2 degrees warming. Um, now, we know that the estimates of the remaining budget, budget still are debated in scientific circles, but Greta and the Fridays for Future movement have made effective use of this budget metaphor to hold us adults to account for our inactions. So, uh, when measured against the carbon budget for 1.5 degree warming, uh, most decarbonisation policies fall short, we already know that, and here we perhaps can turn to the next slide. So according to the online uh, climate policy assessment climate action tracker, Morocco here in green is so far the only country with climate policy pledges that are stringent enough to keep us below 1.5 degree warming. A few countries in bright yellow have policies compatible with the two degree warming target, but most national pledges made to the Paris Agreement so are so far highly insufficient. So if current policy ambitions are not radically increased, as was intended this year, uh, we are heading towards a three degree global warming by 2100 with severe consequences for ecosystems, species, societies and people. Thereof Greta's crisis language and cry for help. So why is it? that a virus outbreak manages to produce an emergency response that 30 years of climate negotiations have not. So how can we explain that governments now gain democratic support for authoritarian policies that severely restrict human mobility and freedoms, but fail to do the same in view of what many climate scientists would argue is a much more profound and long-term climate crisis? Uh, I will not pretend uh, that I have the full answers to these questions. I think we've already heard some suggestions here. But I think one important explanation, of course, is the time horizons of these events. In affluent parts of the world, the threat of the virus may seem much more immediate than the slow violence of dying glaciers, of species extinction, of water shortage, of degraded ecosystems, of agricultural lands. I also think that, that an immediate and a forceful response to the coronavirus holds the promise of a return to business as usual in the near future, whereas an effective response to climate change threatens business as usual also in the long run. To, rep to keep global warming at the safe levels um, asked for by Greta Thunberg and her young climate activists, we need to rapidly steer away from fossil fuel infrastructures and energy systems. We need to rethink the way our globalized economy works. We need to cut down on excessive consumption and travel, change the pace of social life. And I think perhaps most importantly, learn to exercise climate solidarity, responsibility and care. So the time horizon and the nature of these responses, um, uh, responses to these two crises are very different. Uh, nonetheless, I still think that the current Corona event can offer an opportunity for social reflection and learning. And, and we have already heard suggestions of, of that sort. It certainly invites reflection on our hyper-connected global economy. The current lack of medical equipment in many European hospitals 
makes visible how critically dependent societies have become on global supply chains and trade flows. Uh, the transnational spread of the virus also tells us something about human mobility in the 21st century and the acceleration of social life and connectivity, especially in privileged segments of society. So uh, these socioeconomic in interdependencies are signatures of a liberal democratic world order that has championed peaceful transnational relations through free trade, social mobility, strong multilateral institutions. And I think it's this order that both the corona crisis in the short term and the climate crisis more long term call into question. So I think these crises invite us to consider how to best organize global life in the future. And uh, I look forward to talking more about that with you as we proceed. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. Uh, let's see if we can move on. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for, for, for that one and for bringing Greta into the discussion also. Uh, we turn directly to our next speaker and uh, this is uh, Victor Galas. He is the Deputy Director and Associate Professor at Stockholm Resilience Centre at Stockholm University. And he's also the Programme Director at the Bayer Institute of Ecological Economics. Uh, one of the institution, institutions of um, the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. Uh, Victor has been very active on Twitter, if you, if you um, uh, follow him uh, those days. And uh, when uh, debating Corona and climate change, uh, one of my favorite quotes from Victor goes, the Corona crisis is a hundred meter race and the climate crisis is a marathon but we need to run both at the same time. So welcome, Victor. Thank you, Eva. I hope you hear me okay. We do. Thanks to Mr. Geopolitics for inviting me. I think this is a very, very important discussion to have in very troubling times. Uh, I, as some of you know already, I, I, I find it very difficult to see a silver, silver lining uh, in what we experience at the moment, but uh, but of course, it's our responsibility to to help the public and and uh, people to unpack what's happening. What I want to bring to the discussions, I think, are four concerns uh, for for trends or early warnings of, of where this these events might take us into the near future, um, and and in the end, try try to get a little bit more into what can we do proactively to steer away from, from some of the worst impacts. So my, my first point is, of course, something that people have already touched upon in, in a very good way, so both Dan and Matthias and Nick, is that the, climate, the, the political and economic context for climate negotiations is, has just totally changed, and not for the good, uh, to, be, to put it very, very briefly. But you already said that. The only thing that I wanted to bring to the table, in addition, that, that also applies to the biodiversity, biodiversity issues and, and the Convention for Biological Diversity uh, that was moving into a post-2020 framework. Very important, ramping up actions at the international level to address biodiversity. And biodiversity loss and habitat loss is much more closely associated with pandemics such as these than climate. Uh, and it was, the term is emerging infectious diseases or, or zoonosis. So that's a concern. So what's happening now is undermining our capacity to address not only the climate challenge, but future pandemics. The other point for the next next animation, please, uh, that I wanted to bring out is based on historical examples of financial crisis and how they impact on our living planet and the climate, is that there tends to be domino effects. And, and I think uh, Nick already brought that up in terms of, of massive loans and, and uh, for foreseeable debt that many countries will face, especially in the global south. Historically, we know that some of the effects will be an increased extract extraction of natural resources. So, so it's not just about the cli climate. It's not only that the, the climate curve will move up again. It's also that some countries will be forced to ramp up extraction of natural resources. So we saw that for, for Malaysia after the Asian crisis in, in 1997, you, you saw rapid expansion of palm oil plantations with climate and biodiversity impacts. I'm very concerned of what is likely or could happen in Brazil and the Amazon after this. 
we need to be aware of that there might be needs or, or some countries will see the need to, to boost mineral extraction or, or seafood activities, etc. So it's, it's the whole span of activities that are just that are beyond just the climate. It's also our living planet. So the third third point in the next animation, please. Uh, something that we've seen uh, before for other pandemics or emerging infectious disease outbreaks with pandemic potential, I'm talking about avian influenza uh, and SARS, for example, there is something called securitization. I, I'm not going to go into details of that. It's a, it's a big field, but we know from, from previous outbreaks, what tends to happen is that we get these very, very quick responses based on military force uh, once you see pandemics as, as a security threat. And in many regards, it makes sense because you need to act quickly and, and, and the military and, and, and security framing is what you have in hand. But we also know based from, from other pandemics that these approaches are very reactive. They're very quick, they're very drastic. And, and suddenly you have military marching on the streets. You see that very clearly in Latin America and whatever that means for democratiz democratization processes, etc. Another thing that tends to follow from, from uh, this securitization framing is that it builds on a perception that diseases are something that evolve in the global south from poor conditions that we in the global north need to protect ourselves from at all costs. And that, that narrows down considerably what kind of policies you apply. And I will give more examples of that. So what happens in, the, in this case, and we have saw that for avian influenza, you see that for SARS, is that you see investments in early warning and response infrastructures for one particular disease, instead of, of, of uh, trying to cope with, with a multitude of disease risks, especially those that, that, that have big impacts on the most vulnerable. So while we talk about coronavirus, we are not talking about neglect, neglected tropical diseases, for example. Uh, there is very little discussion, or maybe a little about black health impacts of black carbon in Asia, for, uh, for example. So there's something about securitization that, that brings us down a path that is very reactive uh, and that narrows down the sort of interventions that we take in the end. And then my last point, which, which might seem loosely connected to sustainability, but I think it's important if I can get that last animation, please, uh, has to do with, with data and monitoring and surveillance. So Ian, if you can put that animation on, please. Uh, so we're seeing uh, in many parts of the world now uh, concerns about the fact that the, the digital surveillance states or the emergence of the digital surveillance state mm -hmm which in some senses is logical with more data uh, around how people are moving around in, in cities with cell phones, etc. You can use that data to track movement to make sure that people don't break quarantine rules, uh, etc. And, and that that is happening now in South Korea, Taiwan, Israel, for example. Uh, there are some uh, news articles about Moscow using facial recognition technologies to track people that shouldn't be out moving. Etc. There are apps that you can download in the UK, as I understand it, uh, that can help you track COVID symptoms, etc. The question is, all these innovations, digital innovations, are temporary, but how do we make sure that they're temporary? And how do we make sure that they don't violate privacy, etc.? Mm -hmm. uh, so moving to the next slide, in terms of how, how we can think about this in a more creative way and try to avoid these sort of outcomes. So the first third slide. Um, so what? At this point, we need to avoid a scenario where the climate community has a hammer and every problem is a nail, to, to put it very bluntly. I think the, there needs to be a very serious and honest discussion about how we bring climate and biodiversity policy into the health domain. And I've written One Health there because One Health uh, is a framework where you, where you think about human, animal and, and human health and the interactions of that. So what are the policies that we need to advance in the next year that would have climate benefits, that build on nature-based solutions, but that also reduce infectious disease risks in the future, and especially the most vulnerable. What is that? I'm all for an energy transition. I think it's great, but how do we bring the, the One Health perspective into what we're discussing now in the next COPs, both the climate and the CBD COP? 
Next point. More animation, please. Uh, so the other thing is that we know from before that countries tend to boost their extraction of natural resources or natural capital after a financial crisis. What are the policies that we can put in place in advance to make sure that that doesn't happen in a destructive way? How do we make sure that countries don't boost deforestation rates just because they, they, they need to pay off debts to cope with this massive pandemic, for example? What, what, what's the role of the global community to help do that? Third point. Okay, Victor, is that your last? Two, very short. Okay, thank Moving you. from pandemic preparedness to healthy life from all. So, for example, when preparing for the next pandemic, how do we make sure that the discussion is not just about tracking one disease, and, and fears of, of, of having that hit hit the global north, but how do we secure that those policies take a look at all health challenges that, that people face, especially the most vulnerable. And then the last point, sorry for dragging over, getting too excited about this, yeah. <laughs> uh, in, in terms of privacy. So this is a big discussion already now happening, this big uh, group of people developing things or ideas around responsible AI, of course, uh, related to artificial intelligence, that needs to be brought into discussions uh, about this new surveillance technologies that we're seeing playing out in the world. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sorry for taking up too much time. Thank you, Victor. Thank you. So let's see if I'm in picture there. Thank you, Victor. And uh, now we have just one more presenter to go. So please stay with us. Uh, because soon we will start the Q&A session. But before that, uh, Åsa Persson, uh, you are the research director at SEI and uh, you're the Stockholm Environmental Institute, that is. Uh, I would like to uh, ask you now, since you're the last speaker also, I'm curious about what you bring with you uh, from what you've heard here today. We've been tapping a lot of interesting brains here this morning. So. How can SEI contribute in, in this context? And what kind of research do you have? And what more do you want to do in order to address those very uh, challenging questions? Please. Uh, thank you very much, Eva. Uh, of course, it's um, challenging to be last in such an amazing um, panel. I think I expected we would hear lots of good Things. So I will just try to maybe uh, amplify a few uh, things I heard and, and add a little bit, but try to be very brief. And as Eva said, maybe share something how we approach it from SEI. First of all, I would say, I mean, just to point out that this we're still in extreme uncertainty. We're about one month into something that could be an 18 month um, a uh, flow of events, very unpredictable. Will we go back to business as usual? Will it be business as better or business as worse? So uh, at the CI thinking about this, uh, obviously we have received questions about what does this mean for climate emissions and so on. I think this is wholly unsurprising and in fact uninteresting. Um, basically the world economy has just pressed pause. Um, what will happen to climate policy? I would agree with Matthias there that it's still looking uh, reasonably good. Um, I think this um, circumstances we're in will indeed in unleash a lot of innovation and creativity, uh, both within the negotiations, how to run the meetings, but also from the climate movement uh, outside of the uh, negotiations, putting pressure. Uh, I'm quite interested to see how the sort of much higher level of public opinion around supporting uh, climate action now compared with 10 years ago when we were heading into the last financial crisis, if that will have an effect or if indeed also the, the sort of um, uh, priorities among the public will shift as a result. But I think possibly we're in a better place. So uh, what we're really concerned with uh, at the is, is like uh, also many other Speakers have pointed out uh, the sort of uh, impending economic crisis. How can we ensure a global recovery that is sustainable and just and resilient? Um, we have, I think it's significant to point out that in the last 10 years, we have had this long global economic boom uh, in Sweden. It's been unprecedented uh, long. 
So, and this is when we have made climate progress. Um, so this is also an interesting thought experiment. If we had not had COVID, would we still head into um, an economic recession and how would that affect our climate action? Um, so I think uh, we need to, um, uh, we would have perhaps needed to adapt anyway. Um, uncertain geopolitics play into this global recovery strategy. Um, I hope we will end up with the geopolitics of cooperation, uh, sort of that uh, Nick was outlining how that could look like. But will it be geopolitics of isolation or geopolitics of conflict even? Um, uh, we have also started thinking about these third order impacts that, that Nick mentioned. How will this affect trade flows, not just of medical supplies, but eventually uh, food uh, and other essential goods? How will it affect refugee camps, migration flows? Um, and also, uh, if we sort of expand from our quite Eurocentric perspective, we have uh, who will step in to support uh, the Global South in their recovery. Um, Ten years ago, this was led by the EU and US. Uh, now China and Russia are more assertive. Will this lead to potentially higher carbon lock-in? Uh, we don't know. Um, so um, we have started thinking about sustainable, just and resilient recovery. This is a mouthful and I can um, understand that if, as a policymaker, if you're faced with a 10% unemployment rate, that these principles sound very uh, expensive, potentially. So um, fully agree there also with Nick that the key is to sort of make uh, a sustainable recovery, a green recovery, sort of interest based and try to mainstream this into stimulus packages. Um, one minute, OK, thanks. <laughs> um, so um, I will then just say uh, a couple of points. I do think uh, this uh, pandemic is sort of in a way uh, productive for the Agenda 2030 because it forces us to be a bit more focused. I think it's a very sort of um, good example of sustainable development, showing that you can't you can't um, sort of achieve environmental gains through socially and economically uh, unsustainable ways. Um, and I was quite pleased to see that the UN Secretary General had connected Agenda 2030 and COVID response uh, in his recent report this week. Um, I think um, there are interesting uh, links between uh, the pandemic response and climate uh, mitigation, climate adaptation, general economic recovery, uh, when we look at the relationship between urban and rural areas. Uh, but maybe I'll leave that as a cliffhanger for the Q&A session. So I would just end up saying that um, obviously I think this 10% unemployment rate, if that's what we're looking at, it will be a game changer for climate action. Of course, it will compromise the fiscal muscle uh, by governments, but I'm also quite hopeful about uh, this level of innovation the collective creativity that Pianola uh, started um, talking about at the very start of the web webinar. And I do think we're in a better place to mainstream in um, sustainable development in these uh, recovery packages. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Osa. Thank you for being a little bit of hopeful there at the end. Uh, I would now, now uh, like to turn to all of you out there. Uh, it's a, always a dropout when you send live, but we still have over 600 people watching us, us, us right now, which is wonderful. So uh, Rob, uh, please, can you um, perhaps look at the questions there we have received already and uh, maybe post one or two to the panelists so we can start the Q&A session. Rob, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Thanks very much, Eva. And uh, hello to everybody who is joining us on this webinar. Um, we've received a lot of questions, um, fantastic questions, sharp, um, and uh, I think they will stimulate a really interesting debate. Um, some of the questions were directed to specific um, uh, pa uh, panelists, and I will come to those. But I want to start off with some sort of 
quite broad questions that um, I'd like to pose to all of the panelists and I'd like them to keep their answers extremely short. So what I'm looking for is a sort of a yes, no and a, a couple of sentences uh, to justify your answer. So um, I'm going to start off with a question that's come in and I, I'm afraid I won't be able to say necessarily everybody's name and where you've come from. Um, there were almost 50 questions that I've tried to, to go through. Um, but I, I did see that there's a question from Victoria Cumming, who's from Bloomberg, uh, and she's asked, and I'd like this to go to all the panellists, um, will there be a sub sustained reduction in greenhouse gas emissions? We've seen that there has been a reduction. Will it be sustained? Keep those answers as short as you can uh, with one or two sentences for justification. And let's start um, by going in reverse order. So I'm going to start with Orsa, please. Uh, a sustained reduction, my answer is no. Just look at historical data. Bianola. Yeah, well, my answer is also no. But I think not, not a, because the emissions will go up immediately in the, ne the next coming years. I'm quite sure of that. But I think the stimulus packages uh, will make a difference if we can turn them towards a, a more green deal type of, of recoveries. Uh, Nick uh, mentioned the 15 percent that were, went into green technologies and a green recovery in the last uh, recovery period uh, the more than 10 years ago. And that was, of course, a very little part. And we saw the emissions going up of the other 85%. But those 50% made a difference in boosting the renewable energy technologies that we now see are taking off. So, so there is some hope in that. And Nick, over to you. Um, the reduction won't be sustained, but I think we have now achieved peak emissions compared to 2019 and that will be sustained. And Dan? Yeah, I suppose my guess is as good as anybody's. I would expect some of the areas of reduction that we've seen like transport to air transport to stay down, but others there's going to be a sharp boost. I don't know how the arithmetic will work out. Thanks very much, Dan. Interesting there to begin to break this down into different sectors and industries that might or might not be contributing to uh, an increase there. Um, Victor, do you want to take over? Uh, my answer would be no as well. Um, essentially, we're not we're not seeing a deep change in the structures that create emission reductions at the moment. So my short answer would be no. So there it's the the problem lies in the the system the, the structures are not being addressed and therefore they're sort of inbuilt the motor is is built to to, to drive that forward ever well, your perspective yeah thank you well i i just shared the sentiment of the previous speakers that obviously putting society on, on hold um uh, reduces emissions but as as we start to sort of uh accelerate again uh, we will see uh emissions growing but perhaps uh, our transportation patterns may change. Perhaps our willingness to travel across the globe will, the appetite, appetite for that will, will decline for a little while. But I, I agree with others that we need to see more profound societal transformation in order to see the, the, the emissions go down long term. Thanks. Uh, and Matthias, uh, if you're still there, um, what, what's your perspective? Well, I'd share the uh, the assessment by 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 the other panelists that the this current reduction will not be sustained. But of course, there is this opportunity to make to find new ways of of, uh, of you know structurally within the economy and our societies to to chart a way into uh, meeting the goals of the Paris Agreement and the SDGs. Thanks. Thanks very much for those um, initial uh, answers to the questions. I think it, it opens up a whole series of follow up questions. Um, so I'm going to uh, throw out a few of them here. Uh, to, to the panel, I mean, I think that uh, one of them would be, uh, are there examples uh, of sort of virtuous examples of recovery policies um, that allow us to 
stay within planetary boundaries? Which are the sectors uh, that might be targeted in that case? Um, are there ways of combining uh, an increase in employment uh, with uh, a, a sustained, just and resilient recovery? Um, so I throw that question out to the panel as well here. Can you get a little bit more dig in, a little bit more into specific examples? We start with uh, with Björn Ola. Well, yeah, I need to think a, a while for to find really good examples, but we can we see several successful recovery packages in 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 Europe or also restructuring packages where we have. Uh, I'm struggling to remember now. I read a report on the on the on the restructuring of some coal based regions in in Europe uh, and uh, like in Spain maybe Nick can talk about about uh, the, the the examples from from the UK but where it's clearly has been possible to phase out um, the carbon intensive industries and uh, make the the regions at least um, well still competitive or, or turn to other uh, productions and so on. So there are several examples uh, which now are used as as, as uh, inspirations or, or lessons learned for the uh, for the just uh, transitions policies that uh, the European Commission now are are embarking on. Can I come in just a second? Can I, I Ian? Thank you. Can I get, just come in with a follow up question? Because I saw Rob, uh, we had one from um, from the audience here also about the urban societies here. What is going on there? And perhaps uh, you can give us examples of that in your answer. Um, some sort of international alliances or platforms, please, someone is asking for here. And where are the lacking? Uh, we are uh, sort of lacking uh, to connect the dots in human nature interaction, but where is this and how could we uh, work with uh, with this to find the synergies? So that was just a follow up. So please, Rob, go ahead. Yeah, I think Nick is um, uh, waiting to, to Nick hop is in our on next. The, Brilliant. Yeah. So go ahead, Nick. Um, just a few, yeah, the, the poster child of green recovery is South Korea and they seem to be pulling it out again. So hopefully they were 75% green last time. So let's move that. Chinese are already talking about investment in new infrastructure. They've got a 40 trillion yuan recovery going in at the moment. That's um, high speed rail, 5G, um, electric vehicle, vehicle charging, um, building upgrades, heating and cooling efficiency. Those are the areas you'll see. Um, where to put the money, sectors and employment. Um, we're going to see some scrappage schemes, hopefully moving into EVs. Renewables will move forward. Um, we may see lots of tree planting. That's just short term stuff, but structural. Um, there will be a lot of discussion about retrofitting, especially social housing with energy efficiency. But warning sign, the US and Australia did big retrofit programs last crisis done really badly and really shoddy workmanship. And that caused a massive backlash. So. The critical thing we've got to look at is delivery of high quality infrastructure. It's not just chucking money out the door. It's actual delivery of stuff that works or we will just be picking up political problems downstream. Thanks very much, um, uh, Nick. Um, Victor, your turn. Thank you. I mean, I, I think we, we shouldn't underestimate the importance of climate adaptation and resilience in this context. It's not just about mitigation and uh, transport systems, energy systems. It's also what, what are some clever, well-designed climate adaptation and resilience interventions that would help us prepare for next uh, pandemic outbreak or climate shock. I think one of the most clear win-win climate adaptation investments are in the health sector. I think boosting health systems is a good way to deal with many, many of the negative repercussions that we will see from, from climate change. Uh, and and, and that uh, should be a focus as well. Thanks, Victor. Uh, Matthias, please go ahead. Thanks so much. Uh, maybe not to go to to go so much into specific sectors or sort of or or employment, but just wanted to come back and highlight the I mean the 
the decision by the European Council in December on green on climate neutrality by, by 2050 in the EU, and also the recent statement by the Heads of State and Government from their meeting last week, when they tasked the European Commission to come up with a recovery plan, which will be looking into both sort of the digital aspects and also stating very clearly the green transition. Uh, so, I mean, it might not be that we need to be sort of looking for new kinds of solutions, but rather look to the kind of uh, the work which is all which was already ongoing before we uh, entered into this present crisis. So, you know, building on the Green Deal and just from a Swedish perspective, also building on what's already in there, for example, in, in fossil, free, uh, fossil free Sweden and the kind of initiatives we see in various sectors in, in business on sort of, of, of making the transition to climate neutrality. And of course, the merging that work with the kind of recovery packages we see uh, emerging as well. So maybe not so much just looking to new solutions, but building all what we already have. Thanks. Oh, also, uh, I think you also wanted to come in on this point. Yes, I just uh, wanted to make two comments on these um, virtuous examples or opportunities. Uh, one is um, I'm waiting for circular economy, uh, the circular economy community to sort of come into this debate. If we look at the unemployment numbers so far, it's mainly in the retail uh, sector, uh, restaurants, uh, hotels and so on. I think there are opportunities there to sort of shift, uh, make, make a structural shift going more to a service economy, uh, less of uh, goods. So that would be really exciting to, to watch that space. The other point, and I alluded to before, I think there is a really interesting kind of urban rural um, dimension to the pandemic and to climate action and so on. Uh, I mean, we know there's massive urbanization and also I think there's been a certain hype around the agency uh, of cities sort of leading the climate transition and so on to the demise sometimes of rural areas. Uh, have we forgotten about these rural areas? Um, there are many problems, economic, social, um, in rural areas, both, both in the north and the south. And I think this has sort of surfaced now as well with the pandemic, um, but in very different ways. Here in Sweden, um, urban people are advised not to travel to their country houses in the rural areas. Um, we heard from our colleagues in Nairobi that, I mean, they also want to prevent this sort of um, people traveling from the urban to the rural, but, for, but of course they do it for very different reasons reasons uh, because they can't no longer secure their livelihoods uh, in the urban areas. Um, I also think uh, the urban and rural is featuring in the just transition uh, discussions in terms of our rural areas kind of missing out on this, um, uh, the investment in low carbon solutions and so on, and will they take a higher cost uh, of the climate transitions with higher fuel taxes, for example. So maybe there is a kind of win-win opportunity here to think more about a sort of uh, less highly urbanized society, to look at the geographies of our societies, uh, both for uh, sort of pandemic preparedness, but also to um, uh, ensure that everyone is, is part of the climate transition. We have a follow-up uh, there, Rob. Oh, sorry. I can finish there. <laughs> yeah, you, okay, you finished. Thanks, thanks very yeah. much, Orsa. Um, let me pass pass the uh, the microphone, uh, the metaphorical microphone, over to Dan. Yes, thanks. I, my take on this is that there isn't actually a problem about maintaining employment while making either a transition or a transformation because everything that we're talking about is economic activity that will can, will, and should be involving people, and it should be involving employment, therefore. So I, I don't actually see an employment problem if the economy is rolling, if it is moving forward. If it is in recession, that is a completely different matter. Now, there is going to be a bounce back from the recession. Why? Because it always happens. And the question, however, whatever the situation is looking like, the question is, what is the nature of that 
bounce back? Are we at the same time as we increase uh, employment and at the same time, let's imagine the, the most wonderful uh, possible green percentage of investment going in. So we're greening the economies, yes, but are we also learning in a way that prepares us for future crises? Because however well we mitigate climate change, I mean mitigate greenhouse gas emissions at the moment, there is going to be impacts of climate change across the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years. And in some cases, those impacts are going to be existential and in other cases anyway, dramatic and catastrophic with lots of knock-on effects. Plus there's COVID and that is a warning that there could be a future pandemic and so on. So it's a question of doing all of this, understanding that resilience is not just a product of the investment which is made It's a, in the economy. It's a product of much else around that in culture, in education, in knowledge and understanding amongst basically everybody and not just in the business sector. Mm. Can I come in? Please go ahead, Eva. We have actually an interesting question coming in to both Eva Lövbrandt and Nick Mibe here uh, on, on this issue also with with the uh, behavioral change and what is what we see is actually happening now in society. So what can the general public do or continue to do to help sustain and encourage others in society with a newly experienced ecological or social oriented lifestyle practices? Uh, I would like first to turn to Eva and then to Nick. So please, Eva. OK, thank you very much. Um, Interesting question, for sure, um, and of course, a question that depends on the geography at, at where you're, you're based. I mean, here we speak from from Europe very much, uh, but I think from 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 the everyday experience that I uh, I have now in view of this crisis is that we're we're experiencing some sort of social slowdown. Uh, I don't know if we deacceleration is a word, but uh, certainly we're slowing down, uh, we're experiencing a slower pace of life and in, in view of, of climate change that might actually be quite an interesting experience. Um, there is suddenly time to um, to sort of uh, enjoy our family and neighbourhood but also I think recognise the importance of community, social relations and, and also in, in, in the more aggregate sort of a good welfare system, a recognition of, of, of the importance of stable democratic institutions. I think it sort of is an opportunity to, to reflect upon, upon the importance of community in, in terms of crisis. And I hope we'll bring that with us as we proceed in, in our efforts to tackle other crises. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. And, and over to Nick there. Yeah, kind of three. I think this is the most kind of profound piece but it's the piece that my thinking is still evolving the, the three things that i would say is firstly i think we should all of the behavioral science marketing work that underpins so much campaigning and political thinking i think it's completely bust and this has shown it to be bust um because it basically the nudge unit has not been helpful in the uk which is you know some friends of mine from government actually but this is the kind of the end of marginal marginal behavior adjustment and talking much more seriously about humans response to big things so that's the first one you know it's a real opening because i hated that stuff secondly i think a lot of the behaviors will be sticky um i think japanese work office workers will commute less um there will be a reorganization of cities and in particular commuting habits and that's really good. To, how profound that will be, I don't know, but that's one of the areas I think is really interesting. I think the most profound piece will be the relationship between the individual and the state. I think there are some really dark things there, but some really positive pieces of that and about expectations of the state and state competence will rise, um, including in America. But the most important statement, I think, which people missed internationally was Boris Johnson. I often say this who said in his one of his broadcasts before he was put in isolation that there this crisis has shown there is such a thing as society which was him repudiating the legacy of margaret thatcher who kind of said there was no such thing as society just individual families and men and women doing what they want pursuing their interests 
So that I think marks the end of an era from the 80s, which um, politically, which I think is very important. Rob, please, can you, uh, can you, I think we can have one more question if you can aggregate a few of them and then over to your short summary, please, Rob. So I think I think a, a really important question is is the uh, perspective of how to make Please sure that recovery, the recovery, the how to make sure that the recovery is inclusive and addresses inequalities, especially in the global south. And if we can get as specific as trying to think about how what can be done to help countries, especially emerging economies, avoid sacrificing the environment for a quick path back to economic growth. What are those? Uh, because we've talked a lot about sort of things that might be more relevant to the, the global north. How is this a matter of inequality and how do we address the, the specific challenges for the global south? So if I can uh, throw that one out, perhaps first of all to to Victor. Well, thanks. I mean, that's that's a difficult uh, question. I mean, in, in the same way that we talk about uh, Green New Deal, I think there needs to be a Green New Deal for the Global South, considering this that, that puts equity and, and uh, I, I believe nature based solutions at the center. Uh, and, and also keeping an eye on, on the international processes that we have already, such as the climate negotiations and biodiversity negotiations. So, a combination of redirecting capital to boost resilience. Uh, and, and keep keeping momentum in these inter international processes. But that's really just on the top of my head now. I, I haven't thought that through. Thanks, Victor. Yeah, it's a big, a big question. Dan, can you guide us through this a little? Well, I'm not quite sure how far I can guide anybody through anything on these issues at the moment. I think we're all looking at a a fog or, you know, if we're thinking about ships, it's stormy waters. Um, but a couple of things. Um, first of all, I think that there is a very close relationship between what we've been talking about in terms of international cooperation and geopolitics with the situation, situations that different countries find themselves in, uh, in the global south. First of all, if you look at some of the flashpoints during 2019, when I think some of those flashpoints were more serious and coming closer to really major, major war. I'm not saying that they were making major war inevitable, but they were coming closer to that point than we had experienced previously during the decade that has just ended. What was different? What was making things worse? Was the lack of international cooperation? And when you look at the period from 1990 until about um, 2007, 2008, just on the eve of the financial crisis, though I'm, I'm not saying there's necessarily a connection, but you have during that period of the 1990s and the noughties, a huge generation of diplomatic political activity, the massive numbers of peace agreements being drafted and signed, massive peace processes being set up, an expansion of the global zone of peace that looked at from the perspective of the 1980s, seemed like it was impossible. In 2008, 9, 10, the downward trend in numbers of armed conflicts bottomed out. And by the end of the decade of the teens, we're back at the number of armed conflicts that there were in 1990. So there is a connection between international cooperation and peace. There is a connection between toxic geopolitics and conflict. Now, what we're talking about is how many issues, many of them affecting what we think of in the broader security concept, human security, how many issues can only really be addressed if they are addressed cooperatively. Mm -hmm. This is why the norms of cooperation and the laws, the international laws, for example, like respect for treaties, that support cooperation, that's why they're so important. So that's one thing, Thank that's a connection between Global North and, mm. and Global South. I'll, Thank I'll stop Thank there because Dan. Yeah. as well. Thank you. Can, can we just have a short comment from Nick after this, please? Yeah. Firstly, I just want to reiterate what Dan just said, because I think that's incredibly important. That's precisely why we need to win the geopolitics of cooperation well beyond the climate world. Um, I want to do three C's on this. Firstly, commodities. 
and particularly commodities um, associated with deforestation. This is one of the areas the UK was targeting as an up to COP26 and will still work on. Can we agree a set of bilateral or web of bilateral treaties which help countries um, get demand for certified commodities that do not deforest? And that would help this process as a, kind of a new piece of governance that the UK wants to run. Secondly, conditionality. Those of us who live through the structural adjustment programmes we will have conditional debt bailouts. What are those conditions going to be? What? Let's make, not leave the scars we left last time. There's some of the conditions we ramping down coal power stations. Hopefully, lots will be resilience. I and mean, that's a real critical mass issue there: debt bailouts and how we do that better this time. And the last one is China. Um, will China play with the world or against the world? A lot of the debt is Chinese. Will it be inside the IMF game or outside the IMF? Will it be inside the commodities game or outside the commodities game? That will determine whether this works or not. Thank you, Nick. Uh, can I have the camera there, Ian? Um, I would just like to... Uh, OK. Is it Thank me? you, but we, I would just like to to say that we are running out of time, unfortunately. And uh, this th those three C's from Nick uh, was was a beautiful um, uh, summary in a way. But I would like to turn very quickly to to Rob. I don't see the other presenters now if they are waving or not. But we have one minute to go, Rob. So if you can just give us a thirty second sort of wrap. And then uh, we will turn to Bjorn Ola for a thank you for uh, all participating. So please, Rob, first. Yeah, thanks very much, Eva. Um, I, I, I think, first of all, I just want to recognise the fact that um, we've had very active participants participation and a huge yes. number of questions that we haven't managed to get to. Um, that is uh, by no means because we didn't value them. And I, I think there are some very interesting things that have come up uh, to do with values, digitization, the economic system, and we haven't managed to get to those. Apologies for that, but um, I want to recognize the, the, the fantastic participation we had. I'm not sure I can do a better job than Nick and Dan and others have done here, but certainly things that I think are, are particularly significant are around how to make sure that the behavioural change that we're seeing is sticky, um, <clears throat> how to make sure that we are redirecting capital in a way that is consistent with 1.5 degrees, the Paris Agreement, but also crucially the 2030 agenda and addressing issues to with uh, inequality. And that brings in the point that Nick made about conditionality of any uh, stimulus and bailout. Um, I think it was very interesting to hear the idea that the state has now moved into an interventionist phase. And what does that mean uh, for the longer term in terms of building crucially resilience? As Dan said, resilience is a currency that has value in multiple settings and multiple crises and is something we should invest in. And then finally, perhaps this point about cooperation being utterly uh, central to both uh, building resilience, making sure that we are prepared for future crises, but also for taking forward the necessary collaborative agenda around climate action. And before I sign off, I think that uh, I just want to press, put, put a little, little bit more emphasis on the key point that Nick made around commodities related to deforestation. If we don't address that, then we really are undermining and making the climate action uh, agenda far more difficult to address. So this connects with what Victor was saying around the quick win of, of, of some countries wanting to uh, essentially uh, mine their resources in order to get to the recovery. So that's a key area. Deforestation must be part of the recovery policy package. Thank you, Eva. And over to Bianula. Yes, just quickly, thank you so much. This has been very interesting and we could go on and I hope these conversations will continue. There is a lot to discuss and, and think about and, and ponder uh, after this. Thank you so much, my fellow panelists and all you who participated by listening, but also the many questions that we got. This has been overwhelming. We're extremely happy for the, for the engagement. But a particular thank you then to Rob, Eva and Ian Caldwell at SEI who managed the technologies who actually were able to do this without any major flaws. I think that was fantastic experience. So thank you. And can I just say a few words at the end here? 
please. The camera, please. So this webinar has come to an end. Uh, we are so grateful for all the inputs from all of you over the, all over the world. I I I don't I can't promise too much, but we will make some kind of summary. We will try to address some of your questions on our website, and uh, please stay in tuned with us on MrDepolitics.org, and we will see too that some recording from this webinar is out there, etc. So from from my perspective, the most important thing I take with me is that 2020 becomes the super cooperation year, the super year of cooperation. And uh, I would like to thank all of you for participating today. Thank you all. And please presenters, stay just a minute. I would like to follow up with you one thing. Thank you all. Okay, okay. Yes, don't run. Okay, that's right. Hey.